what a nice welcome. I didn't realize I was going to get to walk across the whole stage, so it felt like a really great way to start things off and to see all of your smiling faces here. Welcome to the National Book Awards Teen Press Conference. So my name is Jordan Smith, I'm the Deputy Director at the National Book Foundation, and our job at the Foundation really is to help connect people with books. And one of the many ways we do that is through the National Book Awards. So every year, awards are given out across a few different categories with the goal of celebrating the best books published in the United States that year. And this all takes place at a big fancy ceremony and it's kind of like the Grammys or the Oscars, except instead of celebrating music or movies, we're celebrating books. You got it. So as you may already know, this is a really hard time for books and writers and readers in many parts of our country. Because of book banning efforts, young people your age are having books removed from their libraries and from their school classrooms. And that's usually due to the fact that a book deals with real world topics like race and racism, sexuality, gender expression. At National Book Foundation, we believe that everyone, no matter where they live, should have access to books that tell diverse, complex, and important stories. And we believe that everyone deserves the right to read what they want, and everyone deserves to have books be a part of their life. So I'm so happy that you are all here with us today, making books a part of your life. Speaking of, okay, we can have applause for books. <laughs> Speaking of some books that everyone should be reading, today we are here to celebrate five books that are finalists for the National Book Award in the category of young people's literature. And of course, we'll be celebrating the authors of these five amazing books who you'll be meeting shortly. So if you're wondering how this all works, how we got here today, we start with a group of five judges. This year, our judges in this category read 348 books. And from that, 348, I know, they were busy, they narrowed it down to just 10 books that they thought represented the best of the year, and that's called the long list. From that long list, they further narrow it down to just five finalists, and that's who we'll get to hear from today at our teen press conference. So this is a chance for you, the readers, to hear from and ask questions to an amazing group of writers. In just a few moments, each finalist will read from their book and we'll have a chance for a short Q&A as well. And um, you've all received a notebook as you walked in, a program with more information about the author so you can follow along as they read. You also, of course, received a book. And I'm gonna ask for the house lights to come up a minute so I can see everybody's book. If you could go ahead and hold them up. This is my favorite part of the year, to get to see all of you with your books. We're gonna get your photo. <laughs> all right. And we, you can put them down, thank you. Thank you for indulging me with my favorite moment of the year. Um, we'll wrap up today with a book signing where each of you will go home with your own signed copy of a National Book Award finalist. So before we get started, I wanna do a couple very quick thank yous. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council of the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their support of this program. Thank you to the publishers who donated the books we each received. We're expecting 600 of you today, so that is a lot of books. Thank you to Candlewick, Penguin Random House, Hachette Book Group, and Macmillan Publishers. Um, round of applause for, for our publishers. thank all the staff and volunteers at the National Book Foundation for their help making today's event possible, especially my colleague Juliana Lee Marino, who has organized every single detail to get you all here today. And last, but absolutely not least, let's thank your teachers who brought you here today.
Your teachers came to our office in downtown Manhattan and carried the books back in tote bags and suitcases and backpacks back to school for all of you. So thank you so much to our teachers for all you do. And now I am very excited to welcome our host for today, Danielle Clayton. I'm really enjoying all the applause today. You may know Danielle is the author of the Controverse series, the Bell series, or is the co-author of Blackout, Whiteout, The Rumor Game, and of the Tiny Pretty Things duology, which became a Netflix original series. After growing up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., Danielle went on to become a teacher, and she's also worked as a middle school librarian, so she is no stranger to helping connect young people with good books. Danielle also works as the chief executive officer of the nonprofit organization We Need Diverse Books. And they're right, we need diverse books. As an avid traveler, Danielle says she's always on the hunt for magic and mischief. And we are just absolutely thrilled to welcome Danielle here today as our host for Team Press Conference. Okay, I'm really excited. Um, I can't see anyone, so that's great. Um, <laughs> But good morning. I am so thrilled to welcome you to the 2023 Teen Press Conference presented by the National Book Foundation. And we have the most incredible lineup of authors here today to talk to you about their books. Basically, authors have the best job in the world. We get to use our imaginations all day to also help build the imaginations of young people. It is the honor of a lifetime. And in these turbulent times that we are living in right now, I believe that stories are the things that will save us. They are the things that make this weird world feel a little smaller, a little less scary, a place where we can work out the dark and scary parts of this human existence, and a place where we can meet each other and meet ourselves. And when I was a kid, and I hope like many of you, I actually loved to read. I used to hide beneath my grandmother's table with a stack of books and hoard cookies and lemonade and pillows and blankets. Um, and I would scowl at my teachers if they made me do anything else but read and get sent to the principal's office and get detention um, because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. <laughs> I had my own agenda and it was that I was obsessed with books. But I never thought that I could be a writer because no writers came to my school. And I literally thought to be a writer, to be an author, you had to write something, then you had to die. And then the librarians and the teachers would take that book and put it in the library and put it on a curriculum because I was only reading dead people. And so I didn't realize that it was a real job that you could have. Um, and I love now that I can be a writer. And I didn't realize that there were people that looked like me that came from my family and my neighborhood that got to write characters that reflected that experience. And so I wished when I was your age that I could have read more books that reflected the world and reflected my neighborhood and reflected my family. And so now that I've become a writer, I've written 14 books and created 55 more. Um, books like The Marvelers, thank you. I've been kind of busy. <laughs> um, there are books like, I wrote a book called The Marvelers and the Memory Thieves about a magic school that goes all over the world. Also, Blackout, written with my friends. I never thought you could write books with your friends, but you can. Where 13 teens are stranded all over New York City with someone they like or someone they don't like when the lights go out. Um, and the best part of all of this, that I get to write these stories centering different kinds of characters, is that the industry is slowly changing. And today, we get to showcase that. We get to celebrate many different kinds of stories from many different kinds of perspectives. And there is truly something for everyone. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the, this year's finalists for the Young People's Literature National Book Award. Don't you feel like rock stars? I've never won anything, so it's pretty awesome. I love this. Okay, so I'm going to introduce everyone. So first, we have Kenneth Cadeau, AKA Ken, who is a National um, Book Awards finalist for his novel, Gather. Ken is an, edu an educator and writer who lives in Vermont. 
He worked on this book over the course of nearly 20 years until one day, on the opening of deer season, it all came together. He loves reading everything from fantasy to essays and philosophy, but thinks the most important stories are the ones we tell each other about our own lives. Gather has been called deeply evocative and one of the finest novels of the year. Round of applause for Ken. <laughs> then we have Huda. Fiumi is a National Book Awards finalist for her graphic novel, Huda F. Cares. Huda is a Muslim and Arab American author, illustrator, and lifelong lover of comics. She taught English to middle school and high schoolers for eight years before she started writing about her experiences as a visibly Muslim woman in America. It was encouraged by her older sister to turn these stories into comics. Her work across her many books and web comics has been called delightfully heartwarming and touching and laugh out loud funny. They're very funny. Round of applause. Then we have the wonderful Vashti Harrison, who is a National Book Awards finalist for her picture book, Big. Vashti is the illustrator of the acclaimed picture book, Hair Love, and creator of Little Leaders, Little Dreamers, and Little Legends. She calls herself a storyteller more than an author, and in fact, was scared to try writing for a long time before realizing the story that she had to tell. Big has been called one of the year's most exceptional picture books, and a healing balm with the power to make the world a bit kinder. Let's give a round of applause to Vashti. <laughs> then we have Catherine Marsh. is a National Book Awards finalist for her novel, The Lost Year, a survival story of the Ukrainian famine. Catherine grew up in Yonkers, New York, in the home of her Ukrainian grandma, who taught her to love stories and Bjorscht. She started writing poetry in second grade because she loved her teacher, shout out Mrs. Lazovic, I hope I got that right, and wanted to impress her, and she's been writing ever since. The Lost Year has been called a moving representation of, long, of a long-suppressed piece of history. Let's give a round of applause for Catherine. <laughs> and then we have, last but not least, Dan Santa is a National Book Awards finalist for his graphic memoir, A First Time for Everything. Dan is an author and illustrator who has lost count of how many books he's illustrated over the course of his career, because it's a lot. And last count, he thinks he's done about 130 books. He is the child of Thai immigrants, and while he was born in Brooklyn, he grew up and went to school in much sunnier Southern California. He was accepted to dental school and almost became a dentist before his friends convinced him to try art school instead. That was wise. A first time for everything has been called the perfect balance of humor and poignancy and Santan at his best. And I agree. Give a round of applause. So now we're going to hear from each one of these authors. They're going to give you a little taste of their book. And then afterwards, you're going to have a chance to ask some questions. So please, to start us off, please welcome Kim. I mean, Ken Cadeau. Ready? Ken? All right. I'm going to fiddle with this for a second. Does this count toward my two minutes? <laughs> Sorry, here we go. So, um, in this part of the book, Ian has, the main character has just, uh, the dog has just walked into his life. And um, we'll go from there. I thought I'd name him Hunter at first, since he knew how to take care of himself. But since he was eating mostly vegetables he found on his own, well, that's how I came to name him Gather. So something I have to say is about the word gather. It means a lot of things, like gathering food, gathering your thoughts. When somebody who listens, somebody like the Sharp, when she asks you what it's like to grow up the way you're growing up, you gather together all these parts of your life and all these stories of things from way before, things that get mixed up with what's happening right then. Those stories don't come out like a goddamn timeline. They come out like compost. 
All the leaves, the coffee grounds, fireplace ashes, apple cores, tea bags, onion skins, eggshells, corn husks, potato peels, everything that turned to dirt at one time or another, doesn't matter when, it belongs with whatever you've got growing out of it right there in front of you. Doesn't matter either if you're talking about sugar snap peas, tomatoes, pumpkins, or weeds. You can't go pulling all the dirt away from the roots, trying to put it into some kind of order so you can understand it your way. You kill it if you do that. <laughs> Stories we tell come out like the way you walk the woods if you want to know it. Zigzagging, doubling back, maybe tripling, sometimes enough to find out that the parts you know the least about are the parts closest to home. You don't just make some frigging beeline to some hill like you're trying to get your steps in. I just don't understand people like that. I don't think they're from around here. But I feel like you need to understand this. Our stories come from around here come out like the way we keep our work shed. You go in there, see what you have lying around, some of it being old as hell, some of it being stuff you might have even had the money to buy for yourself. You move something, you find something else, you brush it off a little, then you use it or set it back down. But you need it all to piece together how things come to be the way they are now, how you come to be who you are. And when things go to hell in your own life, the word gather means something else all over again, because there's a lot of good people, some who you know, some who you only just met, and the ones who matter, they listen. They gather on your side, and at least they try to help you, even if it might not all work out. I know that for a fact. Thank you, hi. Um, so I'm gonna read and I'm hoping the, I think the slides should show up in a little bit. Ooh, one second. How are you all today? <laughs> so I'm gonna be reading, while we wait, I'm gonna be reading from uh, Huda and her sisters have just been called in for a family meeting. And these are always uh, a surprise to the sisters, whether they're going to be good news or bad news. And uh, we are going to see what the news was for in a second. Does anyone know a joke? <laughs> um, I guess I'll... So when I was five years old, uh, my parents asked, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a writer. And they were like, that's not how you spell doctor. And I was like, oh, ha, 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 ha. So <laughs> for the longest time, there was this writer's block. I just could I was never going to be good enough to be a writer, according to my parents. So it took 30 something years for me to overcome that and finally put words and pictures to paper and start drawing. And this means so much to me that it resonates with all of you guys and, and, and that you think I'm funny too. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was my only joke. <laughs> okay. In a minute. I also have a webcomic series called Yes, I'm Hot in This. <laughs> if you're familiar. <laughs> oh, man. So this has turned into the Huda show. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, awesome. So here we go. They've been called into a family meeting, and we have Dad. I have some very big news. Mom is pregnant? Ew, what? No, absolutely not. Sit down. What's the one thing you're always asking for? A lawnmower that isn't from the 1800s? A dishwasher that actually works? A professional chef and cleaning lady? Why are you guessing? You already know what it is. I can dream. You all know I started a new job a few months ago, and all along, with a company car and a company phone, I was also given access to a company timeshare. 
cricket, cricket. In Florida, okay. Near Disney World. <laughs> We're going to Disney World. <laughs> what? Yes, what? no way. That's more like it. I was this close to canceling the whole thing. Yeah, Hoda F is ecstatic. Yeah, 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 yeah. That means we're finally gonna go on a plane. Even better, we're gonna make it a road trip. What, what? But Disney World is in Florida. If we're driving, that's, yep, a 24-hour drive. I'm out. Oh, stop being dramatic. Is your selective memory acting up? I don't know what you're talking about. Yesterday, 5 a.m. Wake up, time for fudges. Splash, splash. 11 a.m., I'm gonna start walking like this, so whoever's in my way is gonna get kicked. 2 p.m., I grabbed the remote first. I called it first, get off. 5 p.m., time to clear off the table. Put the food away and do the dishes, let's go. I gotta pee, I got homework, I'm feeling sick. Uh, true story. <laughs> we can barely stand 24 hours together in the house. Imagine what 24 hours together in the van is gonna be like. <laughs> okay, but it's friggin' Disney World, the happiest place on earth. It's gonna be different. I just can't help feeling like this is a trap made to, to make us bond as sisters. Danger, danger. Stop overthinking it. A road trip is exactly what all of you need to bond as sisters. Trap! Well, except Imani. She's got her Quran intensive that week. Yes! Studying the Qur'an with Tajweed, understanding with Tafsir, and I'll be staying with Tete and Jindo. Best summer ever! I love that for you, I really do. But that means Amani isn't going to get to bond with us, and that's just not fair. Well, you're more than welcome to join her at the Qur'an intensive. We'll send you a postcard! Shove! Great! And Amani was the only one we actually get along with. Well, you just say that because she laughs at all our jokes. Yeah! She's clearly the sister with the best taste. It's gonna be fine. You'll see, this trip is gonna rock. Mm. <laughs> I don't understand why we couldn't take Mama's van. It's bigger. You mean your mom's van that's so busted when it was stolen, the car thieves brought it back with an apology and a full tank of gas? We still use the knife they jammed into the ignition to start the van. All right, so there's not as much space as anticipated. A small setback, no big deal. Yeah, I'm sure the rest of the trip will go great. Hour one, huh, stop breathing on me. I'm not. Mama, what is breathing on me? I'm only breathing. I can't just stop breathing. Why don't you give it a try? <laughs> Hour two. Oh, come on, man, who was that? Sorry, guys, I just wrote an article. What? It's what I'm calling my farts now. I'm trying to be more discreet. Well, your article stinks! <laughs> yeah, wait till we're outside before you publish another one. <laughs> hey, I can't stop breaking news. You mean breaking wind? <laughs> oh, wait, this just in. <laughs> Open a window! Open a window! <laughs> Hour three, get off my side. What? I drew a line with my finger. This is my side, you're on my side. We're all squished, there are no sides. Bump. Hey, Mama Huda's pushing me! I am not! Hour four. For if I do, my mother will say, take it away, Dina. Have you ever seen a goose hugging a moose down by the bay? We're so lucky, Mama teaches pre-K, lest we be deprived of such lyrical joy. But if we have to sing one more of these songs, I'm gonna scream! <laughs> Well, that was incredible and so funny. I am gonna bring the mood down a little. <laughs> this is big. I think we will have some slides that will show all of the art. There aren't a lot of words in this book, so it'll be a little quiet. Get ready for a little story time. Get comfortable, sit back. Once there was a girl with a big laugh and a big heart and very big dreams. She learned her ABCs and one, two, threes. She always said please and thank you and even put away all her toys. At dinner, she ate all her food, 
What a big girl you are, the adults would say. And it was good. She grew and learned and laughed and dreamed and grew and grew and grew. And it was good. Until it wasn't. Not a lot of words here, so we're just going to look closely at the pictures. Looks like she's drawing on dresses with the tutu shop. Santa's saying, you're a big girl, aren't you? And looks like there she is at school. One day, something big happened. She's playing with her friends on the playground. Her friends are saying, I can't wait for the recital. I'm going to be a rose. I'm going to be a daisy. And what she's saying? Oh no. Look, she's stuck. OMG, ha ha ha. Moo, whale. More like moose. And what she's saying? Help. It's like here, her teacher is trying to help her out. And nope, they fell. Her teacher is saying, don't you think you're too big for that? You could have hurt someone. You should know better. Those are for the little kids. You're in big trouble. It made her feel small. The words stung and were hard to shake off. She began to feel not herself, out of place, exposed, judged, yet invisible. Everyone had advice, but that kind of hurt too. Hmm, that's no good. Try this instead. This is perfect for you. You're just too big. The flower costume won't fit. Where are you going? What did I say? Not a lot of words left. Looks like she ran and found a little corner to hide in. But something's happening. Looks like she's growing a little bit bigger. And a little bit bigger. <clears throat> we can really see it when we look at the book. It kind of looks like she's stuck on this side of the page. So what do you think is going to happen if she gets a little bit bigger? She fell over. And now she's struggling. And now looks like she's given up. Even in this sad moment, these people are walking by, and what are they saying? Aren't you too big to be crying? Have you tried being smaller? Why can't you just fit in? One day, she finally let it all out. Oh no. <laughs> we can look at the book over here. One day, she finally let it all out and started to see things more clearly. Looks like something came out in those tears, and she's holding something. One of those words. It's big. She started to see things more clearly, and she decided to make more space for herself. We're going to ignore that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not how the PDF should look. But how is she going to make more space for herself? Mm. And she was able to see a way out. Looks like that's the way out. And what is on the other side? It looks like some of those people are there. And she's saying something to them. She's saying, these are yours. They hurt me. She's handing back some of those words. These are yours. They hurt me. Not everyone understood or even listened. 
It's just a joke. It's not that serious. You're too sensitive. Some tried. I didn't mean to hurt you. But they still couldn't see that she was just a girl. I can help you change if you want. But what does she say? No, thank you. I like the way I am. And she was good. That is the end. <laughs> but I'm gonna. I'm just gonna briefly read the author's note. There's a brief author's note at the end I'm gonna read for you guys really fast. In childhood, big is good. Big is impressive, aspirational. But somewhere along the way, the world begins to tell us something different, that big is bad, that being big is undesirable. I was never a dancer, but I did get stuck on the baby swings when I was younger. Some of the older kids and I were playing on the baby swings and I couldn't get out. I was the only one to get into trouble. My size indicated to adults that I was big enough to know better, even though I was still just a kid. I learned that day that my body did not fit, it did not belong, and adults no longer saw me as a little girl who could make innocent mistakes. While my experience was far less overt than the one in this book, the thoughts and words at work are the same. A child sits in the crosshairs of adultification bias and anti-fat bias. She's subjected to judgments and prejudices that are harmful and have lasting effects. Still, she finds enough self-love to return the words that were unkind and unhelpful. I hope she will stand as a guide for all who need to see her journey, especially those of us who are black girls in big bodies. I remember thinking I couldn't wear pink, that it was too bright a color and might make me stand out. From an early age, I developed insecurities that told me it was safer to shrink into the background and try not to call attention to myself. I chose the color palette for this book to reject that old thinking. In color psychology, pink is associated with gentle love, tenderness, and nurturing. Pink flowers symbolize innocence, joy, and playfulness, and happiness. These are all things this girl deserves. Her body is not a problem that needs fixing, and neither did mine that day on the playground. What needs fixing are the implicit biases we all hold. I wish I could give this girl a hug the part of her that is me and the part of her that might be you and tell her that she is deserving of all the care and joy in the world, no matter what. to be here to talk to you about the lost year. Um, I can't draw, so there will be no slides, but I'd like you to close your eyes for a minute and listen. I am going to read you a passage from the lost year. I love mysteries, and this book is a mystery. It tests you as a reader to see if you can figure out the secret and the twist. Matthew is 13 years old and he's stuck home like many of you were during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. His mom moves in his great grandmother. Matthew spends his day on his switch playing Zelda and then he gets in trouble and his mother takes it away for two whole weeks. Matthew is then forced to help his great-grandmother, who he calls Gigi, unpack her boxes from the nursing home. And he finds a photo there that show, he shows it to her of two girls, and she sees it, and she absolutely freaks out and starts to cry. And he realizes that she has been keeping a secret. So I want to read you a little bit about that secret. Please, Gigi, I said gently, tell me about the photo. 
She sniffed. The end of her nose looked kind of damp. So I brought her a tissue from this box mom had left next to her bed. I was reaching out to give it to her when she grabbed my hand. She held it tight as if she was afraid. There were three of us, she sputtered. At first, I thought maybe I wasn't understanding it right. There were only two girls in the photo. What do you mean, I asked. Three girls, she said. Nadia? Right, you. She waved her hand impatiently as if this wasn't a point we needed to keep going over. Helen? The other girl in the photo? Yeah. I waited for her to tell me the name of the third girl, but she was staring off into space. Who is the third, I finally asked. No response. Gigi? But she'd shut off like a phone when the battery is drained and the whole screen goes black in the middle of a text and no amount of hitting the power button will turn it back on. I wondered if I could find an answer in the box of papers and notebooks. I hadn't really bothered to look at them before. I crouched down next to it, lifted the flaps, and peered inside. Some of the papers were typed, others handwritten. Some were in English. Others were in a language with different letters that I guessed were Ukrainian or Russian, but someone had also translated them into English. I reached in to grab some of them, but just then Gigi jerked back to life. No! She said, close it. She was staring straight at me. Sorry, Gigi, I said. I just wanted to know about the other girl. Forget it, she said. No other girl. Then she collapsed against her pillow and turned away. I knew she was lying, but what could I do? I closed the flaps, even though I was dying to get to those papers. I asked Gigi if she wanted to hear more music, but she shook her head. I tried to get her to go through another box, but she wasn't interested in that either. Mom was in her bedroom on a work call when I gave up on Gigi, but she must have heard me because she called out, package for you, Matthew, on the kitchen table. I was briefly excited. Even though Mom wouldn't let me open packages myself in case they were covered in COVID germs and I didn't wash my hands as carefully as she did, deliveries had become a pathetic highlight of my day. But then I saw what she'd left for me, a fancy looking red notebook with an elastic strap. A note from dad was printed up on the Amazon slip. Write, W-R-I-T-E, what's wrong? Love you, dad. I groaned, very punny. I grabbed a pencil off the table, opened to the first page and scribbled, what happened to Gigi? That's what I wanted to think about, not everything that was wrong with my life. Who's the third girl, I added. I underlined this three times. Then I wrote, how do I get Gigi to tell me more? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I too have slides. I am reading from my graphic novel memoir, A First Time for Everything. My name is Dan Santat. Uh, and just a little background, this is a memoir about when I was 13 years old in 1989. You're all in high school. I have two boys who are also in high school. So your parents are probably similar in age uh, to, to mine. Um, and so your parents came from a generation, most likely from a generation called Generation X. Uh, and at that time, we were known as latchkey kids. Uh, and really, to address what the term latchkey kids is, we, we used to wear keys around our neck like dogs. And uh, we were really set, we were just set to do whatever we wanted. Our parents basically, you know, your grandparents, they, they shoved us outside and said, go out and entertain yourself. Don't want to see your face till the sun goes down. And that's basically uh, how, how we were parented. And now, I just find it, I find it odd that we, your parents, are hovering over you constantly and helicoptering and probably texting you constantly about uh, where are you, what are you doing, when are you coming home, and always getting in your business. And I, and I don't feel like we give you all enough credit on the adults that you can be. 
So I wrote this book about this three-week adventure that I took to Europe after uh, having two tumultuous years in middle school. Uh, and I went on all kinds of adventures, one of which was um, going to Paris, uh, being set free in a country that I didn't speak the language, and just walking around the city with some friends until 5 o'clock we would go to the Eiffel Tower. Um, other adventures, I snuck into a discotheque uh, with some girls. You had to be 18 years old. I was 13. Um, snuck into Wimbledon. I watched the men's 1989 men's semifinal match between John McEnroe and Stefan Edberg for three pounds. Uh, stole a bike. Uh, and was chased by four German punk rockers in the middle of the night in Salzburg. Uh, the passage that I'm about to read to you right now uh, is my first trip to a German beer hall called the Hofbräuhaus House in Munich, where the legal drinking age is 14 years old. <clears throat> Hofbräuhaus, House, Munich. Everything is sticky. My shoes are sticking to the floor. All I can smell is yeast. There's enough beer in this place to fill 10 swimming pools. Beautiful ceiling. Welcome to the most famous beer house in the world. Beer is a very big part of their culture here. In America, you have to be 21 to drink. But here in Deutschland, the drinking age is 14 with adult supervision. And those of you who are old enough got permission slips signed by parents to participate. And we walk into the beer hall. And at this time, uh, everybody on the tour bus found out that there was this girl who liked me. Her name was Amy, and at the time, I had a, I had a riz of about zero. <laughs> so I'm going to sit down, and, and I was on a bus full of popular girls, and they were trying to, they were trying to up my game a little bit, and they, they block one of these clean seats, and they say, sorry, this table's full. You'll have to sit at the next one. And I look over, and I see Amy, and they're just they're goading me on. Have fun. We believe in you. You got this. <laughs> OK, everyone, this is a strawberry stout. So you will taste a hint of strawberry in the finish. German beer is very smooth, but can also be very heavy. So if this is your first time, I suggest you drink slowly. And these beer steins were like the size of like one of Shaquille O'Neal's shoes, right? And they set them down. Whoa! Girls, I'd like to propose a toast to the best summer ever. And then I think about this. Mom and Dad would have never have done this on one of our vacations. We would have taken some photos and left. Maybe I've been vacationing wrong. Maybe this is why I never went to any parties. Maybe I just didn't have an open mind. There's a whole world outside of my small town, and I'm lucky to see it. Maybe I should live a little? Are you going to drink? We can't. Neither of us are 14 yet. Are you? I'm not old enough. Neither am I. Wer mögt noch? I am in three more months. Yeah. Let's live a little. I can smell the strawberry. That thing's the size of my head. When in Rome, Mr. Santat, when in Rome, Prost! And then I take a sizable swig. Oh no, this is disgusting. Everybody's watching. Don't embarrass yourself. Wow, look at him go. Go, Dan. Okay, settle down. Get a grip on yourself. You're going to place your glass down and say it was good. Simple as that. One, two, three. Well, how was it? It's delicious. <laughs> really? Yes? Are you done? I imagine you're done. Yeah, I'm done. That was disgusting. I know you're not 14 yet, but I'll let this one slide. First beer. Gross. Why don't you go find some water to rinse your mouth out and get rid of that taste? Okay. Thanks. Okay, I'm back. That was awesome, everyone. Can we give another round of applause for our readers? Um, so much talent, so many different stories, 
so many different paths. But as you can see, there's so many different kinds of ways to be an author, a writer, to tell stories. Um, and so all of these books and all of these authors have created something amazing. All of your different narratives seek to help us make sense of what you went through, what you're seeing, what's in your family, and especially since you heard this in the beginning, but this is a time when many adults want to pull books off of the shelves and prevent you from reading. And now reading has become an act of rebellion. And I'm gonna say one last thing before it's time for Q&A, so get your questions ready, but I just want you to all be brave, be irreverent, to challenge things, to be rebellious, to read something, anything, just read. Because you are supposed to become the next writers, the next generation of authors. And so we need you to tell the truth so that people will listen. So thanks so much. And I'm so excited that you all get to have one of these books. So now it's time for Q&A. Right. Awesome. Can we have one more round of applause for Danielle, our fabulous host as well? So now I'd like to open things up for a short q and I'm wondering if we can bring the house lights perfect. Thank you, so folks can see a little bit better. So how this will work is we have a couple of our volunteers in the aisle who will help you find your way to the microphone in the aisle. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And one of our uh, volunteers will come find you and escort you to the microphone. So yeah, we can start right there. And I'll call them out, Kara, so I'll let you know. Yeah, that gentleman in the blue sweatshirt. Go ahead. Um, you can go ahead and speak right into the microphone and ask your question. Uh, I, I wanted to know, is the characters in Lost Year based off of any real people? So the question was, are the characters in The Lost Year based on real people? Um, I grew up with my grandma, who is Ukrainian, and had a bar here in New York on East 10th Street. So a lot of the stories um, that she told me, and also my mom told me, who grew up, anyone here from Brooklyn, from East New York? So, woo! So East New York, Brooklyn is where my mom grew up and then moved to the Lower East Side. Um, and so I used her stories in this book um, and some of my grandma's stories. However, all the characters are composites, meaning I mixed different sort of real stories with my imagination and with research I did, because I also work as a journalist. And so I did a lot of research to make sure I was um, telling that history correctly. So great question, thank you. Go ahead, Molly, the per that student can come up. Yep. Thanks for your question. Hello? Hey. We hear you. Um, so I had a question for um, the author of Huda F. Cares. Um, my question was, um, what inspired you to write your book? Uh, well, my agent uh, asked me if I thought that I had any ideas to write a YA graphic novel, and I thought, oh my god, I absolutely have the perfect title for one, uh, <laughs> because when I was uh, 15 years old, uh, in, in the 11th grade, having lunch in, in a biology class that was empty, it was by choice, I promise, and um, I was thinking to myself, like, you know, uh, kids can be so mean, and one of the laziest ways that kids can make fun of each other is by making fun of a, a person's name, and so I thought about my name, and I wanted to, like, be prepared in case anything, anybody tried to make fun of me, and, and I came up with, like, I was like, who da, who da F? Who the F are you? Who the F cares? Who the F do you think you are? <laughs> I thought I was so funny. And I told all my friends and they were like, no, that is sad. We're worried about you. <laughs> and so I had the idea for who the F are you? And um, so when my agent um, suggested a YA novel, the idea of, of writing about identity with that title already in mind and writing about uh, coming to terms kind of like, I thought about myself at, that, at the age that you are, and I grew up post 9-11, and a lot of the themes of that era are still very prevalent today, unfortunately, and so I wanted to write about, you know, um, 
identity about what it felt like to be a Muslim, what it felt like to be a hijabi, what it felt like to be American, but at the same time, just what it felt like to be a teenager and feeling like a fake and a phony and feeling like I had to pretend to be somebody else with different people, and then realizing that that was actually really normal for the teenage experience, just really not knowing who you were. So I wanted to write for that audience, kind of normalize it, because I really wish that I had that kind of book when I was growing up to make me feel a little less awkward or fake, that I didn't really know who I was. So that's kind of a long story to your answer, but that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody on this side have a question for an author we haven't heard from yet, for Ken or Vashti or Dan? Well, you're right in the front, so come on down and ask your question. Um, my name is Milani, and I have a question for Dan. Um, did your parents or anybody other than that woman find out that you were drinking below the age you should have been? So I didn't sign the permission slip. I wasn't 14. Uh, Mrs. Bjork uh, was the chaperone for the trip. She was my speech teacher, and uh, in the beginning of this entire trip, uh, I, I did an event where uh, there, was, there used to be a campaign called Say No to Drugs, uh, and they would bring reformed drug addicts to schools to talk about the dangers of drugs to a room full of kids who knew nothing about drugs, and then say, don't do drugs. Um, so my, my, my mother thought it would be a good idea for me to get out of town, and that's how I ended up in that country. Um, the, the idea to drink the alcohol was an impulsive move. Uh, I thought I was close enough to 14. I didn't even sign the permission slip, but I think uh, Mrs. Bjork, uh, who at the time uh, made me go in front of 700 kids to do a speech after this Say No to Drugs uh, speech, and then uh, I had 15 minutes to do a speech in front of all these kids, and I got absolutely destroyed. You know, the kids wanted to go home, and I got shoved in front of 700 junior high kids who just, who just wanted to roast me, and I died. And so uh, my mom thought it'd be a good idea to get out of town. And so when I got out of town, and I, and I went to Europe, and um, I just decided to try to do different things, try to, try to go on different adventures, and really get to know myself, and one of which was to try alcohol. Now, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of you in here that have probably done that before, and maybe your parents don't know. There you go, that's my girl, right? <laughs> And I just want you to say, you know what? It's, it's okay, all right? I'm not encouraging you to drink alcohol, but I do, all you, I do want you all to understand that we as adults understand that we've done the same things, but we just don't care to admit it. But that's a part of growing up, and just be smart about it. But, but it's, your, it's your world to explore, and that's all I have to say about it. Molly, do any of your students over there have a question for Ken or for Vashti? Um, I have a question for Dan. Does anybody on this side have a question for Ken or for Vashti? Sherkar, if you could just send someone up, that'd be great. I can't see super well. <laughs> yeah, step right up. Um, Vashti. I have a question. Um, what encouraged you to like write this book about like the baby and like how she's like growing? Thank you for your question. Um, I wanted to tell a story about uh, how we as adults tend to use worth words with kids. We talk about kids when they're little and we celebrate them for being big. We say, you're such a big girl, you're a big girl now, and that's a good thing. And somewhere eventually in most of our lives, big becomes something bad. Um, and I wanted to reclaim that word for this character, but more than anything, I had read a study that came out of the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality called Girlhood Interrupted that talks about the adultification of black girls. And I just wanted to make work that um, spoke to how black girls deserve care and loving and nurturing and innocence. And that many things factor into these judgments that adults tend to place on kids, including the way they look, the way they talk, how tall they are, how deep their voice is, anything like that. Um, and I just wanted to make space to say, like, kids can 
should have as much time to be as kids as they need, and that you don't have to let anyone else define you. You get to decide who you are, what kind of person you're going to be. People are going to throw things at you, labels, and all kinds of things, and you don't have to let any of that stick to you. And it was something I needed to hear when I was growing up, so I wanted to make that book for other people. Okay, how about a question for Ken about Gather? Sure, Molly, do you want to send that student close to you up? That'd be great. Um, hi. So this is less of like a general question and more for people who read the book. Um, it's kind of noticeable that every time there's a new character introduced to Gather, they always comment on his breed. And I was wondering if there was any meaning to that? Um, the meaning to the breed of gather was really, I, I honestly, I went online and I found out the biggest dog. And um, that's the dog that walked out of the woods. Because I wanted a big dog because he was going through big, tough times. and. Um, and he needed some companion that was unquestioning and uh, going to stand by him. Uh, a, a dog that would be there for you regardless of the massive amount of um, reading you had to do, tiny print you had to go through. This was a dog that was exclusively about love and that love needed to be really, really big to counteract. Um, all of the systemic, uncaring stuff that was happening for, to Ian. Thank you. Thanks. And, and I understand why I was asked last because I'm, you know, I'm a high school principal and I'm really, really intimidating. <laughs> um, I see so many eager question askers lining up and I will say my least favorite part of this event is we will not have time to get through everybody's questions. I'm so sorry, we don't have a ton of time. We have time for a couple more, but I just wanna set expectations. Does anybody uh, who's nearby the microphone have a question that they'd like to ask to the, to the full group? Yes. Kara, do you wanna have? Please. Okay, sorry, Please. go ahead. Please. Okay, I was really, uh, okay. I was really excited to ask this question because like, I was wondering like, what do these books mean to you? Like, while you was writing them, do you connect with the books and want people to connect with you through your books? Like, like to have like a general understanding with everybody in the room. Like I've been through this and probably you've also been through this. So I can connect with you through my book. Like what does this book mean to you? Well, mine is a memoir and uh, if there's if there's anything you want to do to get those feelings out, uh, there's no better therapy than, than writing it down on a piece of paper. Um, so I had a very rough junior high. Uh, and, and so for me, you know, now being a kid, reflecting back to all the experiences I had, and now as a parent, and just thinking about lessons that maybe I could pass on to my own children, uh, I realized that kids are going to be kids. And again, I think I should reiterate that I find it bizarre that we came from a generation uh, of your parents where, where we were free to roam and run around and do whatever we wanted, and yet for some reason I feel like we, we really have a stranglehold on you. We hover over a lot of you. Um, so I, I wanted to give some perspective what it was like when your parents were your age and the freedom that they had, and that it's okay to be curious and it's okay to try new things. Uh, just be smart about it. Um, but the best thing about those experiences is that you get to know more about yourself. And, and when you go out there in the world, you actually realize that the world's a lot kinder than you realize. Uh, and, and that just comes from me telling my own stories and hopefully people who can relate. So when I was around your age, um, my grandmother's cousin who had survived this uh, man-made famine in Ukraine um, told a story um, that I heard of about how that winter in 1932-33, her village in Ukraine, it was completely quiet. There were no dogs, no cat noises, no horses, because they'd eaten all the animals in the village, including their pets. 
And I remember hearing that and thinking, my God, what a horror this was. And yet when I went out in the world and I mentioned this to people, nobody knew it because this history was suppressed. And so this book means a lot to me because this was a piece of history most Americans, most people around the world, for reasons I explore in the book, didn't know about. But we live in a time where there are a lot of lost histories. I think that it's really important for all of us to delve into, and that includes our family histories. Um, and so this book is very important to me um, as something that I hope that you will read and think about what parts of your history have been silenced. Um, so that is why this book is significant. I think about a lot about my grandma who was an immigrant with a fourth grade education and didn't feel like she had a voice. And I think she'd be really proud of me for writing this story. I like that. Uh, this book for me was sort of just a cathartic experience of just communicating something that felt really internal. Um, communicating through art has been something that I've tried to do since I was a kid. I don't know if language or other media types are, are my favorite way of expressing myself, so I really just wanted to s tell this story and to capture what it feels like to have such really big emotions and to start feeling trapped by them, for them to grow and grow and grow and you just don't know what to do with them. So, um, you know, I'm grateful to have been able to turn it into a book to share with people, but before anything, it was just artwork. It was just art that was communicating what I was feeling inside. So, um, that's why I created it, but I hope that it connects with people and either shows them you know, a way out or helps other people relate to the experience for others. So for me, um, Muslim stories don't get told very often. And um, if they do, they're always told through a very specific lens to please a specific demographic. And so writing a book about a Muslim girl who is unapologetically Muslim, who is praying in public, who's talking about making wudu and waking up for fajr and you know, getting to tell that story, I really thought I was um, writing a very silly book. And at the same time, not compromising like who this character was and who she meant to me and getting to write that was incredibly special because you know I wanted to see that out there and so I wrote it and people are reading it and I, I love that I can do that and hopefully represent um, you know Muslim women everywhere and other people who feel like they aren't represented and it happens. So all of you, you know, everybody in this room, um, school students, I have horrible news. You are all managed by data. <laughs> we, when we get together at a leadership meeting, we look at numbers. And, um, and then we read in the paper and we read about numbers of opiate deaths and poverty. And then we decide what to do by looking at numbers. And Every one of you in this room is an N of one. And it's your story that gets left out. And so, you know, Vermont is a really, really small community. And um, when I write about a specific incident or a specific person, people will know what I'm writing about. And so I had to picture a lot of the people like Ian sitting at a table and just think, you know, if Ian sat down at your table. Um, that was the character that I needed to create so I could tell some of the stories of the folks that were sitting around his table. And we can't manage by numbers. We need to listen. And that is actually what your teachers do. And um, I hope that leadership becomes the listener, not the Albertson, who's the principal in the story, but the listener, the teachers, the sharp. Um, and so this was a cathartic experience for me too because I finally got to tell the stories the people that a lot of folks don't want to listen to. Thank you. So if, 
If you had a question that we didn't get to today, I hope you will hold it in your minds and take it back to your teachers and your classmates back at school, because I think there's still a lot of great discussions that can happen around all of these incredible books. Um, in just a moment, we're going to transition to our book signing, and I'll explain how that works. But before we do that, I'd love one final round of applause for our finalists, and then they're going to exit the stage. <laughs> <laughs>